Life is full of simple pleasures, like biting into a juicy mango, taking a long walk on the beach, or secretly selling your coworker Kyle Hill's hair on the internet. It's also full of deeply weird, convoluted, and often bamboozling stuff, most of which happens to be comic book storylines. And few franchises have more convoluted, occasionally baffling backstories than the X-Men. Remember that Psylocke episode? Next year we're getting not one, not two, but three different X-Men-verse movies, including one based on the legendary Dark Phoenix Saga. But what is the Dark Phoenix Saga? Why should you care? Is it just an Arizona City's goth phase, or is it something bigger? Well, today on The Dan Cave, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about the Dark Phoenix Saga before you see the movie. Now, before we get started, here's a quick spoiler warning if you haven't read the comics or plan on reading the comics, now you can't complain. We're gonna talk about them in detail, so either get your local Professor X to mind wipe you or turn back now. Are you still there? Good, great. All right, the Dark Phoenix Saga is widely considered to be one of the best written and most shocking storylines in X-Men history. It has been adapted for the screen several times, including in the 1990s animated series and in the abysmal 2006 movie, X-Men The Last Stand. I love you. God. That movie sucked. Now, most recently we saw hints of Sophie Turner's Jean Grey tapping into the Phoenix Force at the climax of X-Men Apocalypse, which honestly felt a bit too soon if you ask me, but since Simon Kinberg isn't returning my many, many elaborate handwritten letters that I scrawled in the back of Red Lobster cocktail napkins, I don't think he's asking in the first place. So, here we are. In classic comic book fashion, the Dark Phoenix Saga marked the transformation of Jean Grey from superhero to supervillain. But before we get into the Dark Phoenix Saga, get it, Dark Phoenix? Anyway, one must first understand the Phoenix Saga, which is a statement so blindingly obvious that even Cyclops could read it without his silly red glasses. It all started when the telepathic mutant Jean Grey and her fellow X-Men were kidnapped and brought to a space station. But in order to escape, the X-Men had to take a space shuttle through a dangerous radiation storm brought on by a solar flare. And given that the cockpit was unprotected by a radiation shield, there was only one way for the X-Men to survive. Jean Grey had to read the pilot's mind and surround herself with a telekinetic shield to protect herself. Sadly though, her shield wasn't strong enough and she began to succumb to the effects of acute radiation poisoning, kind of like I do every time I play Fallout or even think about going to the beach. It's real bad. Miraculously though, Jean didn't die. She was actually saved by a mysterious cosmic entity known as the Phoenix Force that responded to her telepathic cries for help. And in exchange for Jean's heart's desire to save the lives of her friends, the Phoenix Force gave her immeasurable power. It absorbed part of her consciousness and took the form of Jean Grey, complete with Jean Grey's memories and personality. But much like you can't believe it's not butter, the X-Men couldn't believe it wasn't Jean Grey. In fact, the real Jean Grey was in a weird space cocoon at the bottom of Jamaica Bay. You know, that'll change. Chestnut. That'll strike a deal with a cosmic bird ghost only to wind up trapped in an underwater sleeping bag, Chestnut. Ha! Huh. Not again, bird. Not again. The new Jean emerged from the shuttle wreckage with a sweet new outfit, some bonkers powers, and she was spouting some real Khaleesi-ass nonsense about being fire and life incarnate, you know. <laughs> but since that was hardly the weirdest thing to happen to the X-Men, they just continued on their merry way incorporating Phoenix into their everyday lives. Oh well makes about as much sense as some of the stuff we do. And everything was hunky-dory until the Dark Phoenix Saga. Created in 1980 by Chris Claremont, John Byrne, and Dave Cockrum, the Dark Phoenix Saga unfolded over the course of X-Men 129 through 138, and it's the second half of, duh, the Phoenix Saga. As is the case in many X-Men stories, those mustache twirling jerks at the Hellfire Club were behind it all. The villainous Jason Wingard, aka Mastermind, used his powerful psychic tricks. Illusion, Michael. Mm. Trick is something a whore does for money. His powerful psychic illusions to go all Mr. Steel Yo Girl and seduce Phoenix to the dark side. He convinced her that she was really his weird, evil ancestor and got Jean to join the Hellfire Club as its newly minted Black Queen. At first, the X-Men tried to rescue her, but they got their asses kicked and they wound up imprisoned by the Hellfire Club. Cyclops had it way worse. He wound up in a psychic sword fight inside Jean Grey's mind, and then not only did Mastermind smooch Jean Grey in front of him, but he defeated Cyclops in a duel as well. Great going, glasses. Except things didn't go exactly as planned for the Hellfire Club either. The X-Men eventually got the upper hand, defeating the members of the Hellfire Club, and Mastermind learned that he trained his evil pupil a bit too well. Jean Grey used the Phoenix Force to open his mind wider than one million college freshmen watching Koyana Scotsy for the first time. Unable to comprehend the vastness of the universe, it's pretty big, man. Mastermind's brain was fried and he lapsed into a coma. Then Jean decided to leave with the X-Men, fleeing with them to escape the Hellfire Club's lair, like you do. 
knew. Everything seemed like it was coming up X-Men until of course Jean Grey decided to go full dark no stars and embrace her inner evil. Unable to contain her dark side any longer, her costume suddenly changed to a scarlet version of the Phoenix outfit. She declared herself to be Power Incarnate and proceeded to blow the X-Men's escape craft to smithereens, raining plain parts and injured X-Men all over Central Park. Ducks. The X-Men tried to talk their friend out of beating them into a fine red mist, but she did not listen, and instead laid the cosmic smackdown on them. Then, finally done with this garbage planet, she blasted off into space using the sun's gravity to do a 360 pop shove it into a cosmic slingshot that sent her all the way to the Shi'ar Empire's home system. Once there, Dark Phoenix had an all-you-can-eat solar buffet causing the system sun to go nova, thereby murdering every living being on the nearby planet of Dabari, which I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's de pretty bad. And if that wasn't horrifying enough, old Cyclops had a front row seat to this mass murder fest because of the psychic connection that he shared with Jean. Jesus Christ. And as anyone who's eaten their body weight and solar energy knows, you're just gonna be hungry in like 30 minutes. So naturally, Dark Phoenix set her sights on a steaming hot bowl of Earth. What followed was an epic throwdown between Dark Phoenix and the X-Men outside Jean Grey's childhood home. Using a synaptic scrambler designed by the Beast, the X-Men were able to briefly get the upper hand and Wolverine was close enough to actually kill Dark Phoenix, which Jean begged him to do, but he just couldn't get it up. I can't. His claws, I mean. And Jean's dark side took control once more. Professor X even arrived on the scene to do telepathic battle with Dark Phoenix, when suddenly, out of nowhere, they were all transported halfway across the universe to a Shi'ar Imperial cruiser. Yikes. And instead of a welcoming party, Dark Phoenix, Professor X, and the X-Men found themselves face to face with Empress Lalandra, the Empress of the Shi'ar Empire, and Charles Xavier's buddy. And naturally, Jean going super slain had the side effect of the Shi'ar leader, Empress Lalandra, ordering Dark Phoenix's destruction. She told her main squeeze, Chucky Zaves, that they wanted to execute Dark Phoenix. But instead, Professor X invoked a duel of honor that pit the X-Men against the Imperial Guard over the right to decide Phoenix's fate. The two sides threw down on the moon's blue area, which apparently exists, and by and large, the X-Men got their butts handed to them. Eventually, Jean Grey wound up losing control and the Dark Phoenix took over once more, causing the X-Men to focus their attacks on their former friend rather than their newfound foes. Colossus quite literally smacked some sense into Jean with a powerful blow, and she temporarily regained her sanity enough to run into a tunnel where, in front of Cyclops, she commits suicide using an ancient Kree booby trap, saying that her death is the only way to stop the Phoenix Force. That's basically the most horrifying way imaginable to say, it's not you, it's me. That's, <laughs> is that too dark? <laughs> Crying out Scott's name, she died as her body was incinerated by the Kree device and Cyclops was completely and appropriately devastated. What followed was a seriously sad issue in which the team remembered the good times they had with their dearly departed friend and Cyclops ultimately deciding to leave the team for a time. Which, you know, like super understandable, dude. What the hell, you saw some f***ed up stuff. While this wasn't the last time we'd see Jean Grey in the Phoenix Force, it was certainly the most memorable. And here's hoping that with the Dark Phoenix movie coming out November 2nd, 2018, they'll finally learn how to do justice to this landmark X-Men story. No! Or maybe they'll just give up and give us a creepy Mojoverse movie about the dangers of reality TV. And that, my friends, is everything you need to know about the Dark Phoenix Saga in a nutshell. What moments from the comics are you most excited to see on the big screen? What other X-Men stories deserve movies? Let me know in the comments below and give me a mutated thumbs up while you're there. Now be sure to like and subscribe or else you might miss next week's show about the story of a French girl who's horny for books and winds up living in a castle with a selfish prince who must learn to love or else be turned into a tattooed Viggo Mortensen forevermore in Beauty and the Beastern Promises. Until next time, keep on digging. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At Quinn B. Ginger asks, why doesn't Rick go to a different universe where they still have the sauce? Well, Quinn, you're obviously talking about season three premiere of Rick and Morty where Rick uh, wants the Mulan sauce from McDonald's. And you see, the thing about that is, well, I'm, I, I'm sure they, what you get to understand about Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon is, you know, huh, wow. Yeah, guys, uh, why doesn't Rick go to a different universe where they still have the sauce? Let me know in the comments below, and I'll see you guys next time.